All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Zero to Infinity and Beyond, a webinar hosted by Nova Education. And we are so excited for you to be joining us today because we have some special guests from the National Museum of Mathematics in New York. Um, my name is Ralph Bouquet, and I am the Director of Education and Outreach for Nova. Um, we're so happy to have you all join us because today's topic is all about math. And so uh, we are doing this because next week we're going to be premiering a new film uh, called Zero to Infinity, which basically explores the concepts of zero to infinity and how they revolutionize mathematics. And so even though these uh, concepts are seemingly, you know, opposite, um, but they are actually very indispensable concepts that are actually relatively recent human inventions. So discover the surprising story of how these key concepts revolutionized mathematics, how they came to be, uh, not just once, but over and over again as different cultures invented and reinvented them across thousands of years. And so, again, this is a new Nova film uh, called Zero to Infinity that will be premiering next Wednesday, November 16th at 9 p.m. Eastern on your local PBS station. And so today we are so excited because we are having some special guests from the National Museum of Mathematics. Um, our guests are Cindy Lawrence and Dr. Tim Chartier. Uh, say hi, y'all. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I'll just quickly sort of uh, read their bios and then we'll transition uh, to a uh, some a series of presentations that they have prepared for us. Um, and again, the format of this virtual field trip, uh, we'll start off with some bios and introductions, then we'll transition to some presentations. And then uh, after that, we'll transition to some Q&A and some audience Q&A. So if you have some questions about their presentations, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, we'll be taking and asking them whether or not you are on, whether you're on Zoom webinar, on Facebook or YouTube, you can just use any of the chat features on those platforms to submit your questions, and we'll make sure to get to them uh, later on in the presentation. And so uh, today I'm very excited to introduce uh, Cindy Lawrence, who is in her leadership role at the National Museum of Mathematics. Cindy Lawrence strives to change public perceptions of mathematics and to improve and diversify mathematics education. She focuses on the creative design process for all exhibits and programs, both on-site and online, as well as overseeing all aspects of museum operations, including public outreach and engagement. And under her stewardship, uh, MoMath, located in New York City, has attracted more than 1 million on-site visitors and currently engages audiences in all US states and territories and in 125 countries around the world. And so um, thank you so much for joining us today, Cindy. We're so excited to have you here with us. Um, with her as well, is Dr. Chim Chartier, who is the 2022-2023 Distinguished Visiting Professor for the Public Dissemination of Mathematics at the National Museum of Mathematics. He is also the Joseph R. Morton Professor of Mathematics and Computer Science at Davidson College. Uh, Dr. Chartier is a, also a professionally trained mime, and so he's gonna get, be getting into some of that today. Um, he's performed throughout the United States and in Panama, France, Japan, South Korea, and the Netherlands. He trained at Le Centre de Silence Mime School and in master classes of world-renowned mime artist Marcel Marceau. He also serves as an expert for national media outlets such as the New York Times, CBS Evening News, and ESPN for sports analytics. So if you are a sports analytics fan, uh, please prepare your questions. Uh, Dr. Chartier will be able to answer those questions for you. And so again, uh, if you're just joining us, we are tuning in to uh, From Zero to Infinity and Beyond, a virtual field trip presented by Nova Education in collaboration with the National Museum of Mathematics. So again, if you are interested in asking any questions about the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat um, on YouTube, Facebook, or in the Zoom webinar. And so, uh, yeah, I will now hand it over uh, to Cindy and Tim. Thank you all so much for being here with us. All right. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Nova, and welcome to everyone. As Ralph mentioned, my name is Cindy. I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the National Museum of Mathematics. We are located in the middle of Manhattan. For those of you who live nearby, we would welcome you and your classmates to come and visit. But if you don't live nearby, we also run online field trips, and we'd be delighted to welcome you to our virtual world as well. With that, we're gonna kick things off with a little bit of mime. And for that, I'm happy to reintroduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Chim Chartier. Thank you, Cindy. Well, welcome. Welcome to MoMath and welcome to New York City and welcome to a time when we actually think about zero, which
which in itself was a big idea, and infinity, which is clearly a huge idea. Now, to help us begin to think about how math can conceptualize this, we're going to do it through mind. Part of the reason for that is that math, in a certain sense, has this invisibility to it. And yet, through thinking mathematically, the invisible can become visible. In this sketch, we're going to imagine that on the floor, there is a rope that goes on forever in both directions. And so I'll hand off the mic to Cindy and then come right back and we're gonna do the mime together. So before we take questions from Nova, let me point out two parts of that sketch for you that help us think about the infinite. The first is the part where the mind, me, has the rope and I grab it with one hand. And with my other hand, I take the scissors and I cut it and a huge part of it goes away. Well, the question I have for you is how much rope remains? So take a moment and think about that. How much rope remains? It still goes on forever. That is very different than other things that measure size. If something is four, I have four of something. When I take some part of it away, I end up with a completely different number. But infinity is different. I can have an infinite amount, take an infinite amount away, and still end up with an infinite amount. It's part of the reason that math can help us think about that and get a little confused too. Now in the introduction, it was pointed out that zero infinity can kind of couple together. We're gonna to see more of that in a moment, but we see that at the end of the sketch where the mind, me, holding the rope, and then with the scissors, I cut it. And I cut it again and again and again. If you just think of the numbers between zero and one, there are infinitely many numbers just there. They get infinitely small. So in that sketch, we're able to see that inf infinity is indeed huge, but can also have to do with the infinitely small. All right, Ralph, did you say you had some questions? Yes, no, thank you so much for that presentation, Tim. Um, one question that I have is sort of how has our understanding uh, of infinity changed over time? So has it always sort of been uh, sort of consistent? 
one of the biggest parts about mathematics is the fact that infinity, anything with infinity, has often caused people to argue. One of the big ideas of infinity that was the most profound is, believe it or not, there's more than one size of infinity. That can just feel like it just is wrong, but it's not. And it turns out that there was a mathematician by the name of Cantor that actually showed that there are multiple sizes. And then later it was shown that there are infinitely many infinities, which is its own idea. So yes, it has evolved over time. And again, if you do have any questions, please make sure to please drop them into the chat. We'll be taking questions also via Zoom, uh, via the Q&A feature, as well as from YouTube and Facebook as well. Um, so we do have one question uh, coming in from Zoom. Um, and this person is asking Michaela, uh, what's infinity times infinity time minus infinity? Is there a way for us to even sort of compute uh, infinity as, uh, as a quantity? There is, but it turns out that if you were in my calculus class and you saw infinity times infinity or infinity minus infinity, we actually will say that means you have to do more work. Because one of the weirdest parts is that you can make that equal infinity, you can make it equal the number one, you can make it equal one, two, three, just to get a quick sense of why in the world would that be true? I'm not going to do the times infinity for a moment, that's its own idea. But if we just take infinity minus infinity, take one, two, three, all the way, and two, three, four, all the way, and I take one, two, three, and I subtract from all those numbers, I get rid of all the numbers that are in two, three, four, what do I end up with? One. But I could have had one, two, or I could have had one, two, three. So that's why you have to do more work, because you may see, indeed, that you have infinity minus infinity, but you have to do a little more work. Infinity times infinity is a little more involved than a Zoom call. Thank you, Kayla. All right, thank you. Um, one other question coming in from uh, Facebook. Uh, Russell is asking, uh, do you feel like the human brain can truly comprehend infinity? I believe that through mathematics, we can comprehend infinity. But without mathematics, I don't think we can comprehend infinity. It's one of the things that drew me to mathematics because I was already a performing artist. It was literally when we began to talk about that multiple size of infinity that my body went, I wanna be in this room. I want to actually do this. And so I like math because I can understand things that still confuse me. And I think a lot of life is that way. It's wonderful when I understand things, but if I think about it a whole lot, a lot of things are still kind of confusing. And I think that's part of what's exciting about life, which is why I enjoy it within mathematics. Great, uh, another question that we have uh, is we're starting to get a lot of questions right now. Um, this is a question from Carolyn asking, uh, is a root of infinity real or imaginary? Is it possible to have a root of infinity? Well, infinity, infinity is not really a number. So it, it feels like it is because it's a sense of size that measures size. So you, to say that you have infinity would be that you have a number times a number equals infinity. And since you can't really do that, there may be mathematicians who would say, oh, this is the square root of infinity. But offhand, I'm not sure exactly how to do that. That's a cool idea though. And that kind of idea is if you were to sit and think about it, you might even come up with a new way to represent mathematics, which is how when they said, well, what if we take the square root of the negative one? A whole field of mathematics grew out of that. Why don't we move away from the questions for a moment, just because a lot of these are about the infinite, because we have a very surprising mathematical art piece that involves infinity and zero to share with you. All right, and to do that, we're gonna start some slides. And we are going, one moment. 
Can we forward to the next slide? Okay, we just saw the infinite rope and okay, can we go? Okay, here comes another slide. And you're all probably looking at this and thinking, well, that's, that's something I've seen before. It's just a box or a cube. And what I want you to think about is if I asked you to cut this cube into two equal pieces, how might you do it? So take a moment and think to yourself how you could split this cube into two identical pieces. Well, there's one way you could do it. You could slice it from top to bottom and have two equal pieces, but that's not the only way. And I bet some of you were thinking about something else. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, there's another way we could cut it from top to bottom and make two triangular pieces. But of course, I know some of you are thinking of yet another way. Let's move to the next slide. We could cut it across horizontally and get a top and a bottom. So those are the most obvious ways that we all think about cutting a cube into two equal pieces. But there's another way that probably will surprise you. And let's move to the next slide and see what that is. We can slice it at an angle and those two pieces are exactly the same. The surprising thing is though, if you look at the face that's exposed when you cut into the cube at that angle, you end up with a six-sided figure or a hexagon, which I think we can see in the next slide. So there you see a cube cut into two exactly identical pieces, and somehow we found a six-sided figure hiding in the middle. We think that's so cool that when we built this museum, we actually built a vestibule in the shape of a glass cube, and we put a red line around that hexagon. Let's see a picture of that. There's the entrance to MoMath. We have a pie-handled front door, and there you can see the cubic vestibule with the red hexagon highlighted. So if you come to MoMath, you will walk through not just a glass cube, but what we call a hexagonal slice or cross section of that cube. Now I wanna take that and combine that with another idea. So let's move to the next slide. One more slide. Uh, I guess we're not seeing on the screen what you're seeing on your computer. So one moment while maybe there's a delay and we catch up. Meanwhile, you can see the lovely front entrance of MoMath, which I hope many of you will come and visit. Okay, here we go. So now I hope you're all seeing a cube and you can see it's kind of lightly scored or lined. So it almost looks like a Rubik's cube, but it's all red. And I want you to imagine for a minute that we cut a hole, we took out the center cube and went right through the middle of that cube. And we can do that actually in more than one direction. Let's look at the next slide. Okay, so here you can see there's a hole going right through from the front to the back, from the top to the bottom, and you might even be able to see from the side, from the right to the left. So here's this cube that has all these holes in it, but we can go a little further. Let's go to the next slide. We can put more holes through this cube in three directions, but smaller and smaller. So we look at one square of the original Rubik's cube and we take a hole through the center of that. And then if you think of lots of little squares around that hole, we can take holes from the center of that. And when we do this, we've created something that has a special name. It's called a Manger sponge. Looks a little like a sponge, but it's really just a cube with a whole lot of square holes drilled right through it. And now the really interesting question is, what would happen if I took a cube with all these holes and I sliced through it at the angle that we looked at before that'll give us two equal pieces with that hexagon hiding inside? Now, if we did that and we pulled the two pieces apart, of course, we're gonna see the hexagon, but it's gonna be filled with holes too. And the question is, will those holes still be square? Or will they be some other shape? And if there's some other shape, what shape will they be? The answer might very well surprise you. Let's take a look. Hey, there's the slide. We're about to pull the two pieces apart. Oh my goodness, stars. How in the world did squares turn into stars? When I first saw this, I was amazed. And I hope you are too, because that's the feeling you can get when you play with mathematics. 
you start out with something simple, something that's not that hard to understand, and suddenly you see something surprising and beautiful and wonderful. And we actually have one of these right here. I'll let Tim come and uh, you can pick it up if you like, Tim. And let's zoom in a little bit. And you can see that this actually exists. There are all the stars. And so math really does create beauty and incredible things. And it's a lot of fun to explore. Now I'm going to turn it back to Tim to talk a little bit more about the Manger sponge and how that relates to infinity. One of the things that's surprising in that is the fact that if you were to drill infinitely many holes in that, that you don't just end up with nothing. And that's why zero, that going towards zero is very much tied into the fact that we do something infinitely many times. So we wanna show you really quickly how you can make a two-dimensional version of the Manger sponge. So for that, we go to the next slide. So what you do is you'll begin with an image. We're going to start with so this is a do-it-yourself fractal. It's one that you'll be able to do. I will show it to you first, and I'll give you a web page that you can go to. So let's go to the next slide that we have. So it's do-it-yourself with math, and here it is. We have the MoMath logo. So what you do is you have your logo, then you shrink it to one-third its size, and then we'll go to the next slide, and it'll show you that we place it in those eight positions. So we shrink it by one-third, make eight copies, and place them as you see in the slide. Now that's our current image. So we take that current image, shrink it by one third and place it in the exact same positions that I just placed the images, which is what you see now in the slide. So wait a minute, how many of these would there be? So I started with one, then I had eight and I have eight copies of eight. So this one has 64. Well, that's now my current image. So I take that image, I shrink it by one third and I place those eight copies just as I did before. And what do you think we'll get in the next slide? We indeed get the Manger sponge. And these are called levels. The initial image is called level zero. The first one that you see with the eight is level one. So even in this very quick, what do we have? Zero, one, two, three. By the time we get to three, it's a pretty convincing Manger sponge. In fact, if you actually go to level four, you don't really see a whole lot of difference in what we have. So let's go to the next slide, which shows you how your classroom can do this on iPads, smartphones, computers, and tablets. So there is a web page, lifeislinear.davidson.edu, and it's called Serpinski's Carpet. It's not Manger Sponge because that's three-dimensional. The carpet is two-dimensional because it lies down. And as you see, you can make an image choice. And then on the right, you see that you can decide the number of levels. And then you hit Generate Image. So let's go through the next slides just so you see it one more time in terms of how that'll work. So let's say that we go with a square wheel trike. You came to MoMath and you saw, when you went through that cubic vestibule, you saw, holy mackerel, there's a square wheel trike. That's gonna kind of hurt my back. And then you notice that there is this bumpy ground. Well, it turns out that MoMath used math to design this so it's a completely smooth ride. A flat ground is a smooth ride for a round tire. This ground is a smooth ride for a square wheel uh, tire. So now what happens? We make eight copies, all one third the size, go to the next slide, and there it is. Make eight copies of that image, put them in their position, and you get very analogous to what we had before, but with less white space because there's less white space in the image. And then one more time, and again, we get our Serpinski carpet. So that's one that you can try together. And with that, we want to move to your questions so we can be sure to answer some of those. So Cindy and I will be here together because there'll be questions I'm sure both of us can answer and we can move off the slides at this point. Great, thank you so much both for, for that incredible presentation. Um, so we definitely have a lot of questions. I wanna start off with one sort of more general question. Uh, we talk about fractals. Um, can you speak to any examples of fractals that we can actually see sort of naturally in nature uh, all around us? So it turns out that one example of a fractal is just a fern or even a tree, that a tree is a fractal of a kind but where it isn't as repeating as what we had there, where you go up and then you branch out. And then for each of those branches, you branch out. 
at the museum, you can actually put your arms out and your arms get replaced by your trunk and you become a human tree. In computer graphics, if you see a movie and you see a mountain in, a, in an animated film, like a Pixar film, or even in things like, like Marvel films, mountains are made with similar ideas and so are the planets. So if you've ever thought about that, where they look down on a planet and you see a continent, islands are actually made the same way. And it was actually measuring the coastline of an island that first started that kind of movement into fractals. So those are some examples you can look for. Thank you, Dr. Chartier. And that actually leads me to a good question. Uh, by This is from Daniel, who's asking, uh, what is your position on whether mathematics is discovered or invented? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I don't really splice those words differently. I think that it very much is discover. Oh, I see. So it, discovery would be that it's already there, and invented would be that you created it. There's actually an entire field of philosophy called the philosophy of mathematics, where that's entirely what they talk about, because you can look at it both ways. So if you look at it both ways, that just shows that you're walking down the road of the philosophy of mathematics. And I have a slightly different answer to me. I think math absolutely exists. There are all kinds of examples in the natural world around us. So I think it's discovered, but I think we invent mathematical structures and, and ways to look at what's around us. So I think we discover it and then we invent more math to really understand what we're discovering. All right, uh, we have a question. Um, and this is from Landon, who is six years old. Uh, he says that this is his favorite topic. Uh, my mom is helping me write this. I wanted to know, is there a number higher than infinity? And also, are there any great interactive resources? This is a question from uh, Landon's mother uh, for interactive resources to learn more about all of this. So there are multiple sizes of infinity. So in that sense, there is a larger infinity. And to give you a sense of two types of infinity, one of them is the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five. And amazingly, if you just take the numbers between zero and one, that's a bigger sized infinity than the other. And there is a game that's actually called dodgeball. You don't play it trying to dodge a ball but it's in a book by Edward Berger and Michael Starbird. It's a book that we actually did at MoMath for what's called tween primes that we looked at. And it's a game that you can play to actually begin to understand the proof of that. And so those are some, some resources. Those are book resources. In terms of online resources, I would just do a Google search for some of that and see if you can find things, but you can also, I'm the only Tim in the Davidson math department and I'm the distinguished professor so you can find my name and I can help you with the email. Great, thank you so much. Um, so this is an interesting question uh, from Steven and Zoom. Um, related to sort of understanding zero as well as infinity. Um, if we can't divide by zero, nothing, uh, would that also mean we can't divide by infinity, everything as well? Yes, that's true. There are two things that you don't, it's like, it's like you need a buzzer in calculus. One thing you don't do is divide by zero. The other thing you do, don't do is divide by infinity because again, it can be pretty much whatever you want it to be. And that's why we call it indeterminate. It means I have no idea. I have to do more work. And it can feel like it should be something. Many times people will divide by zero and feel like it's infinity, but it, you can quickly show it can be different things. That's very good intuition in terms, of, in terms of seeing that and asking that. I haven't been asked that in a calculus class. It's really nice. Okay, so this is a very interesting question um, related to uh, infinity for time versus infinity for space. Um, is the mathematics that's used uh, for infinity of time also equal to the mathematics that we use for the infinity of space? Are those, is there some relationship between those two? One of the complicating factors of the infinity of space is the fact that space is three-dimensional in terms of the way that we experience it. And so that, in a sense, is a more complicated kind of um, 
idea of infinity is that even if you just look at the plane, time you can treat as just like a number line, just, just going in one dimension. So the ideas are, can still have a lot of overlap, but the, the moment that you go from just a number line to like a XY plane where you graph points, let alone when you go into 3D, things can get different, even though at the same time they can sort of be the same. We have a couple of questions. I think uh, the conversation around space and around nature has uh, prompted a few more questions related to that. Um, when we think about, and this is a question from Eric on, on Facebook, um, astronomically speaking, the cosmos is infinite, but then you have to equate the expansion or the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. So how does that work if we think of the cosmos as infinite, but we also know that, uh, that you know, what we know as the universe is also expanding at the same time? One of the complicated parts of space is if it's expanding, what is it, what is it expanding into in, in terms of that? And it's part of the reason why at times people will even talk about that there are multiple universes and there can maybe be infinitely many universes, which I don't work in that field. So that one I can't wrap my head around in terms of, in terms of that idea. So I think that's part of what you're getting at. And that's an entire field called astrophysics Astrophysicists are very powerful mathematicians in terms of what they do. I have an astrophysicist at Davidson who I'm very good friends with, and I often joke that he's an applied mathematician like me. And that's about as far as the joke goes. We both laugh and then we move on. But he also teaches very powerful mathematics in his classes. So I realize I'm not totally answering your question, but that's because I am an applied mathematician in the area of computer science and data analytics. So I don't know more than that. But that's the avenue that you can go toward. And so now this is a more general question related to um, where did the the or what are the origins of the symbol of infinity that we use uh, that's commonly used, sort of that that eight that's on its side? Uh, do either of you know sort of where that came from? Um, and, and, and why we use that particular symbol. No, we just checked with each other. Neither of us, I've seen before why that's the case, but I have forgotten. And one of the things when Cindy brought up earlier that math is discovered, but then that convention is in, we invent the conventions that enable us to communicate it and look at it. That's an ex exact example of that, is that there was probably different ways that people were representing infinity and then eventually there became one way. And one of the things with me as a research mathematician, there is not always one way that people are representing the same thing. I can be completely lost with what someone is saying. And then someone can lean over and go, oh, that's right. You didn't come from, sometimes they'll say that school. And then they'll go, this means this, this means this, and this means this. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and that's because of the fact that we are discovering the same thing but inventing different types of notations to describe it. And if I could add one thing to that, I think that's part of why MoMath exists because mathematicians have some very deep and interesting ways of looking at the world. And we exist to try to translate those ways so that anybody can come in and play with math and play with sometimes some pretty deep mathematical concepts, but that are presented in a way that they're fun, you can explore them, you can enjoy them. Thank you both for that. Um, and Cindy, this is more of a question about when you think about, you mentioned sort of the, the ways in which uh, the Museum, National Museum of Mathematics allows us to understand these concepts. Um, can you both speak to some examples of ways that we see zero to infinity in everyday life when we encounter it? One of the things that's interesting to me, uh, this is not quite answering your question. I'll come back to that in a moment, but. One of the things that's interesting to me in terms of the sports analytics that I do is the fact that so often it's the farthest thing from infinity that you can get is that, you know, if you can hit 62 home runs, that's amazing. Well, you didn't even get to 100. I mean, it's not a really big number. And yet at the same time, it turns out that any number really isn't that big when you start talking about infinity. The biggest number that I work with is two to the 63rd. So that means two times two 
and you multiply two by itself 63 times. And that number is called nine quintillion, which is nine with uh, 18 zeros after it. I think I have that right. It's not March, so I'm not sure. And the reason I point that out is because that's how many brackets can be made in March Madness. It always seems like somebody should be able to get that, and nobody ever has. And just two days ago, somebody won Powerball, and that number is really big. It's one out of 292 million, but it's nowhere near that other number. So that's a place where I sort of feel like I'm getting a sense of the infinite because some of these numbers get really big, but then suddenly I'm also very aware that in the expanse of the infinite, even the numbers that I think are big are still really small. Thank you all so much. Uh, and again, if you're just uh, tuning into us right with us right now, uh, this is from zero to infinity and beyond a special virtual field trip uh, presented by Nova Education in collaboration with the uh, National Museum of Mathematics. So we're so excited to have you join us. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in Zoom via the Q&A feature. Uh, you can also submit your questions uh, in the YouTube uh, chat or on the in the Facebook chat as well if you're watching on either of those platforms. And so, um, yes, we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, a couple of folks are actually dropping in some math problems as well. So I don't know who will necessarily go there. Um, but a couple of interesting conceptual questions too. Uh, and this one is uh, from uh, Julie um, in Zoom uh, asking, uh, does a circle have infinite sides or no sides? And there's actually a very interesting uh, segment in the film, uh, Zero to Infinity, that sort of uses a pizza pie to talk about, about that. But we'd love for, to hear from you all what you uh, your thoughts to, to that question. Well, it turns out that when people were first, so they're called pie hunters, which is what is that expansion of pie? And it goes on forever and never repeats. So we're never gonna figure out all the digits because it goes on forever. There are infinitely many and there's no pattern to it. But still people wanted to know some, like I know 3.14, I really know 3.14159. That's as far as I know, which for some people can almost feel like I shouldn't have a PhD because I should really know more than that. But that's enough for the work that I do and I know where to go to look it up. But people wanna know more of those. And Archimedes was one of the first people in Western culture to actually look at that and so he started with a square, then he went, to, which has four sides, then he went to a pentagon with five, and he kept increasing the number of sides completely related to your question. Because as you increase the number of sides, just like we saw earlier with both the 3D, 3D printed Manger sponge and the 2D Sierpinski carpet, that there comes a point when it doesn't look any different as you begin to get regular polygons with, the, with increasing number of sides, it completely looks like a circle. So in some branches of math, they do talk about a circle being a polygon with infinitely many sides. So in terms of whether or not it is, it kind of somewhat depends on the field of math in, that they're actually working from in terms of the way that they want to look at it because of the branch of math that they're in. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from uh, Kent on Zoom. Um, and I think some people are trying to figure out, are there um, sort of objects or things that we can use to help us better understand infinity? Uh, and so Kent's question is, uh, does a Mobius strip represent infinity or could that help us sort of understand infinity? Good question, can you repeat that? Oh, does a Mobius strip represent infinity? One more time, I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, Mobius strip. Does a Mobius strip represent infinity? Or can that help us understand infinity? I'm going to let Tim answer that. But first, in case anybody doesn't know what a Mobius strip is, let me first tell Excuse you. Excuse Mobius. <laughs> My apologies. You take a strip of paper and you close it into a circle and you glue it together. You could wear that on your wrist. It's a bracelet. It's a paper chain. But if you were doing that, and right before you glued the two ends together, you turned one of them upside down and then glued it together, you'd have a loop of paper with a little twist in it. And if you take your pen and you start coloring one side of that Mobius strip, what you're gonna find is you'll go all the way around and you'll end up having colored what appears to be both sides of the Mobius strip without ever having lifted up your pen to go to the other side. And so what you've actually created 
is something that has one interconnected surface, even though locally it appears to have two sides. So now I'll turn it to Tim to talk about how infinity might relate to that. To be quite frank, I don't know how to, how to connect infinity to the Mobius strip, but that, the fact that you actually are asking means that there probably is a way to connect that, those two concepts together. Because the fact that it's one-sided in itself very much makes it a very different mathematical object. And that, that falls often in the realm of what's called topology, where you have objects and you study their shapes. So one of the things that I think is very important in math is that when you don't know something, you just say you don't know something, and then you help people know where to go look. Sometimes it feels to me like it almost seems like if you're good at math, then you just, yes, I know. And nobody knows everything that's going on. That's part of when you get a PhD, you learn that you know a lot about a particular area. But it's also important to honor when somebody has an idea that is a little different, a little different can be a whole new insight. So the fact that I don't know could just be you do a Google search and you know, or it could be that as you explore that, there are some really neat ideas that you can uncover. And just to add one or two more things about the Mobius strip. First of all, if you do come to MoMath, you can actually drive a car on a Mobius racetrack. And that's a lot of fun and lets you see firsthand what it's like to move around that surface. If you're not in the New York area, we actually do an online field trip called Mobius Madness. And you will not believe the surprises that come out of that session. So I hope many of you will maybe sign up for one of those. Thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna take a few more questions uh, before wrapping up in a couple of minutes, but uh, I did wanna just quickly transition to uh, think to talking about sports analytics, because I know uh, Dr. Chartier, that's something that you really uh, you know, think a lot about, but I guess I was sort of wondering what is sort of your favorite aspect of doing sports analytics? Uh, what are, are there any sort of problems uh, in the sports analytics field that you feel like, you know, are like the big questions that haven't yet been answered yet? Um, and also sort of which, which type of sports analytics do you prefer the most uh, out of, uh, out of all the sports that, that you, uh, that you work with? I do the most with basketball. And one of the reasons I do the most with basketball is I am a professor when I'm not at MoMath at Davidson College. And if you follow the NBA, I am at the college that Stephen Curry went to. So it is a college that is very into basketball. So it was very easy to start the group that started with three students and grew to be 100 students in terms of the size. So what if you want to get into sports analytics? One of the big areas right now that's important to you and if you're not someone who does sports where you can help other students at your school in sports is actually injury prevention, where we study how, when and how people get injured and maybe what's going on in practice, maybe the types of teams that they played. In my work in soccer with the women's soccer team at Davidson College, the women wear heart rate monitors. And we were able to find that when they played certain types of offensive schemes that the other team had, they needed to practice different going into that game so that they didn't wear down their bodies, which would show up late in the season. The worst thing in the world is to wear out at the end of the season because the end of the season is when you're in the playoffs. And so that was something that they would use our results to actually study. I actually work with the NBA league office right now you are free to ask me questions, but you probably want to ask about something else because most of it I'm going to say I'm not allowed to talk about that. But what I am allowed to talk about is that I'm doing anti-cheating analytics. So we're actually, it's called game integrity, where we're actually looking at the game to be sure it's played fairly in terms of what's happening in the game. I also worked with a vice president of the NBA who I met through MoMath. He came to my talk in 2013 or 14. And he, we worked on officiating and we were looking at a particular rule to be sure that up to human error, it was actually done fairly. The one that I've done the most with is actually March Madness, where at Davidson, I'll have 400 kids come into our auditorium and I'll teach them how to look at March Madness through the lens of math and how to make a math-based bracket. So you may not get a perfect bracket, but you can sometimes get a bracket that's really good, even if you don't follow basketball at all. So those are some examples of some of the things that I do. That is awesome. That is so exciting. I know uh, 
I'm a very, very big basketball fan myself. And I, I do think um, the introduction of uh, the analytics and the way in which it's uh, changed, even the way people, you know, play basketball. I mean, you mentioned uh, Steph Curry earlier and even how, you know, folks are now realizing that they should, you know, optimize for the three point shot more. There are so many teams that have completely changed sort of their strategies for even the players they're choosing based off of that, I think is very, very fascinating. And again, just shows, you know, the, the incredible power of math to sort of, you know, even really change and impact the sports and how we and how we play them. Um, so that's really, really exciting. Um, so this is a sort of a, a this is a nice little closing question, I think. Um, but Linda from Zoom is asking, um, and I guess this is a question for both of you, uh, who is the best mathematician ever? And I guess we can modify that to also who is your favorite mathematician ever and why? <laughs> My favorite mathematician is Sophie Germain. Sophie Germain lived in a time when women were not accepted as doing mathematics. So she did mathematics and sent it to school with, with male friends and put a male name on it. And then in time, a very famous mathematician figured out who it was and he still worked with her. But part of the reason that I so enjoy her mathematics is that every time you see a picture or actually see the Eiffel Tower, the mathematics that she created or discovered in terms of what she had is why the Eiffel Tower can stand. And so she's my favorite mathematician. And I'm going to choose a living mathematician. And with no insult or offense to the many mathematicians I know, I'm going to call out one in particular as, as a favorite, one of my favorites, which is Dr. Manjul Bhargava. And Manjul Bhargava is a Fields Medalist winner. That's the highest honor you can receive in mathematics. So he's obviously a very talented mathematician. But one of the reasons I want to call him out as being special is because he's a mathematician who is really dedicated to sharing the beauty of math with everyone, whether you're a mathematician or not, whether you love math or you hate math. And it's really a partnership with Dr. Bhargava that helped us create the distinguished visiting professorship that allows us to invite even more amazing mathematicians like Dr. Tim Chartier to spend a year with us and to really bring true mathematics into the public realm and excite and delight people. And so I'll just call him out as someone who's had a tremendous role in the programs at MoMath and in making sure that we are accessible and engaging for all. Thank you both so much. Uh, I think uh, a closing question, and this is really a question uh, I think from one of the students watching, um, what is something that you both wish you knew about math when you were in school? I wish that was when I was in school, I learned more about mathematical art and that is being taught much more today. So you may hear me say that and go, I learned mathematical art. That's why I love coming to classrooms is that so many things are taught today in new ways. But when I went to conferences, one of which is held by MoMath, it's called the Moves Conference. The mathematical art that people do really blends creativity and math. And there are many, many ways to do it. You don't have to professionally train in mime with Marcel Marceau to be creative and use art. That's something I wish I had known about much earlier because I might have seen myself as not just being good at math, but being more of a mathematician much earlier in my life. And for me, one of the things that I didn't realize, and many of you may not realize, is that math is a field that is ever growing and we're always learning more. We all understand that in science, there are unsolved mysteries. We haven't yet cured cancer. We haven't yet put a person on Mars. And so we know there are things that we, we wanna do that we haven't done yet. But what I didn't realize as a student is that math doesn't end at calculus. And there's lots of new math just waiting to be discovered. And so if you're the kind of person who wants to explore, math actually is a field in which you can make new discoveries and explore the world and find things that nobody ever knew before. All right, well, thank you both so much. Um, 
Uh, this has been a really incredible experience. Um, I feel like I've learned so much uh, about math and its various applications, definitely a lot more about infinity than I knew before. Um, but again, if you are interested in learning more about the concepts of zero to infinity, uh, please tune in next Wednesday, November 16th at 9 p.m. Eastern on your local to your local PBS station to watch uh, Zero to Infinity, uh, which is a one new Nova documentary all about how the concepts of zero and infinity revolutionized mathematics. Um, throughout human history. And so this is a really, really incredible uh, show to watch. Uh, you can watch the trailer. Um, if you visit the link uh, that's been posted um, in the chat, as well as on Nova, uh, in the YouTube and Facebook, uh, you can watch the trailer uh, for this film, which premieres uh, next week. Um, I would really like to thank, uh, again, uh, Executive Director of the National Museum of Mathematics, Cindy Lawrence, as well as the Distinguished Visiting Professor, uh, Dr. Tim Chartier, for joining us today. This has been an incredible time. Uh, we really appreciate you all taking your time to join us. Um, and again, please check out uh, the National Museum of Mathematics. You can visit their website to check out uh, some of the events they host, um, check out their exhibits. They also have a lot of really engaging uh, activities online as well. And so, um, yes, thank you both. And any closing words that you all want to share, please feel free to do so. Sure, I just wanna thank you for hosting us. And also you mentioned the website, you can go to momath.org and read about all the programs we have to offer. Great, thank you all for coming and enjoy mathematics and enjoy exploring the many ways that mathematics can engage your mind. Awesome.